Hello folks, Mike Lavelle. Good to have you back. I'll be covering one of the three programs we have for long distance flights after the Lindbergh flight. As you can see from the title, I'm gonna be talking about the Pacific in the summer of 1927. Uh, this talk is a little different than my two colleagues who featured an aircraft and their crews on long distance flights. This will certainly be a long distance flight. We'll cover the distance between the mainland, specifically San Francisco and Oakland, out to the Hawaiian Islands. As you see here on the screen, about 2,400 miles or so. Uh, what we'll be doing though, we'll be looking at several different aircraft and several different crews and the results of all that activity. It's pretty much focused on the summer of 1927. And if we look at a timeline, this is what we'll be talking about. And you'll notice right away, I've added yet another flight other than the 1927 activity, which you see through the screen from about May to uh, August of 1927. But there was a, an attempt at that same route uh, to cross from the mainland to the uh, islands by the Navy in 1925. So we'll take a look at that. That's kind of the, the foundation of uh, the rest of this activity that you see on the timeline, with the exception of Charles Lindbergh's flight in 1927, May of 1927. That caused a catalyst, uh, catalyst of lots of activity uh, from that point forward, which picked up uh, all the events that you see on this timeline, which we're going to review, uh, that it includes uh, the flights of the Dole Race and those before the Dole Race. So to kind of start, let's just kind of take a look at the uh, flight that the Navy had in May, or excuse me, in August of uh, 1925. Why was the Navy doing this? Well, it's kind of in their purview to do such flights uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, they had a base out there called Pearl Harbor in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, they've had long distance flights before. 1919, they had the three NC flights across the Atlantic. Uh, to demonstrate their capability as far as the Navy air wing. Uh, the Army came along in 1924 and had the world, uh, around the world flights with the Douglas World Cruisers. And now we're sitting at 1925 and it's about time the Navy thought that they would now go ahead and conquer the Pacific. The original plan was to have three of these flying boats, such as the one you see up in the upper uh, right of your screen here, the PN9. Uh, they started out with two, the one turned back, and the one that uh, got the furthest uh, was the PN9. So the PN9 took off from uh, the uh, San Francisco Harbor, as it says there, August 31st, 1925, and proceeded out on course, staying on course, uh, making relatively uh, good time, uh, reporting in on the picket boats that were out there from time to time, but a problem was arising. The aircraft commander, who you'll meet here in just a second, his name was uh, Rogers, uh, noticed that they were consuming far more fuel, especially the port engine, than was planned for. He attribute that to a couple of things. One, a couple of the long takeoff runs and finally breaking ground with a heavy loaded aircraft, uh, but the uh, port engine, right, uh, the left engine was uh, running rich. Uh, they attribute that to uh, uh, part, uh, spark plugs that they changed uh, it's in San Francisco. Uh, but the problem it was causing, they weren't going to make Hawaii on the fuel consumption that they were experiencing. So into the flight, uh, they reported uh, to a ship that they were uh, northwest of that ship. The ship uh, uh, took that to mean that they were on a heading to the ship on a northwest heading. That would play into a factor that you're going to, uh, we're going to kind of talk about here in just a moment. The long and the short of it was, uh, they started to look for a ship on that picket line that would be able to refuel them. They could not find that uh, ship. Uh, the commander, Rogers, ordered a landing. So they put down, after making a uh, progress of about 1,841 miles towards the island, as you see there, another 450 miles to go. The landing was a good landing, no damage to the ship, 
they thought they would be found quite easily uh, within a few hours. Um, actually, uh, they began to realize that the ships were looking for them in the wrong direction. Why? When they reported they were north uh, west of the ship that they reported to, the ship interpret that as I said before, uh, they were headed northwest to the ship, but so the ships that were out there all started uh, looking to the south rather than to the north where they went down. Consequently, they were in the water and they heard some of the transmissions that the ships were going in the wrong direction, just simply on battery power before the battery uh, gave out. The dilemma. Now they know they're there. They took stock of what their situation was. They had food for at least five days. If they rationed that, it'd be longer, which they did. Uh, Rainwater would provide them with the need of water that they would have from uh, if they had a long extended uh, 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 boat ride. Uh, but from the bottom of the ship, or excuse me, the uh, wing, they removed the fabric and fashioned sails between the wings and they decided to go about and navigate uh, the rest of the distance to Hawaii, again, the 450 miles. Nothing was heard from them. They were presumed lost at sea. As a matter of fact, they were out there for eight days when uh, due to navigation, they actually found the Hawaiian Islands. They could see Oahu. Again, uh, the commander, Rogers, who uh, I'd like to introduce to you now, and the rest of the crew, you see them there on the uh, PN9. This is just before departure. Everybody's kind of in happy mood there, waving. Rogers is in the center there. Interesting background. Uh, John Rogers was an Annapolis graduate. He was the number two Navy pilot after uh, 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 Eli. And uh, being a interested in aviation, he actually accompanied his cousin Cal Rogers on the first transcontinental flight across the United States. And then he went to, and had a, a, some service time as a pilot with the Navy. However, in 1912, he returned to the fleet simply because the air arm of the Navy at that time wasn't offering promotions uh, if you were in that uh, activity. So it was kind of a, a uh, uh, an assignment that where you would go and uh, get the experience and then go back to the fleet, which he did. He became a submarine commander. But when the Navy wanted to plan for this particular flight, they selected Rogers for his ability to organize, to plan, have an understanding of aviation as well as navigation. So with his crew, they were going to take the PN9 that you see here. This is the specs for it, basically, as it would be delivered uh, from the uh, Naval Aircraft Factory. And there was modification to it, obviously. It didn't have the fuel load as it was delivered necessary for a flight all the way to Hawaii. But with the fuel load that was um, put on board with the alternate fuel systems, you can see there was a, quite a change in gross weight, which accounted for the very long takeoff run. Well, now it's in the water, of course, and they have turned it into a ship. There has been no word from them. Uh, they're presumed lost at sea. Hopefully they would find them. Uh, uh, the newspapers, of course, picked up on that immediately as soon as the, the word was that the ship was down. I like this one right here that you're looking at, the PN flying boat. Uh, Plane's fuel store is gone, lost at sea. The reality was they were never lost at sea. They knew exactly where they were. They were quite adept. Many, uh, at least three of the pilots were at uh, celestial navigation as well as uh, the commander himself. Uh, however, as I said, on the ninth day, uh, they um, uh, were found off the coast of Kauai. Uh, Rogers went that direction, as I said before, because he thought the currents would be more favorable. They got within 10 miles of Kauai trying to make all kinds of signals and flares uh, to grab attention of the folks on a wide that they're out there. And a submarine came up in back of them, which they did not see. They were kind of startled by it. Uh, the submarine obviously was going to pull them into uh, pearls, you see in the uh, picture that you're looking at. Uh, the interesting fact was all the crew on the boat, even though they were kind of uh, in a uh, starve, uh, emaciated uh, condition, due to the lack of a lot of food, uh, relatively good shape. 
This is a great photograph of the aircraft after they came off the boat in Hawaii because you can see the bottom of the wing. That's where the fabric was pulled off and they fashioned the sails to sail the rest of the way in. So really they had kind of a successful failure of the first attempt to fly from the mainland to Hawaii. Uh, here's the crew after they have arrived in Hawaii, the, the, the traditional lay, lots of flowers hung around their neck. I'm sure they were very pleased with that. Uh, their pants uh, were uh, taken from surplus or supply, I should say. And it looks like a mix of army as well as Navy uh, trousers there. And of course they would take the ship back home. So that was semi-successful and the boat itself was repaired and remained on the islands, especially in the Pearl Harbor area and flew patrols in the Hawaiian Islands and in the Pacific area near the islands. So that was kind of the, the first attempt that set the baseline. Um, now, if we go back to our timeline, uh, things aren't going to pick up until May, uh, May of 1927, but there was an important event in 1926 that would come to bear on the United States and industry, and that was the 1926 Air Commerce Act. That act became law on January 1st of 1927, and that would establish the certification of aircraft, pilots, air, uh, airports, navigation aids, air, airmen's medicals, etc. cetera. Uh, that would be the FAA today. That was their foundation back then. So some regulation and planning and et cetera would now be necessary from this day forward. Uh, before all that really got into place though, the world was awakened to a, a great event when Lindbergh flew the Atlantic in, in uh, May of 1927. No doubt about that. That was a uh, outstanding feat. Uh, Lindbergh became an icon just about overnight. Uh, everybody wanted to uh, celebrate that event. It was a worldwide event. Lindbergh himself was interested in promoting aviation. He was not what you would call a risk taker, although he did take a very calculated risk on that flight itself. Uh, and other people had great ideas and there was a great catalyst for other thinking that could possibly, the airplane could possibly uh, now go forward and get backing for. One of those folks that were thinking that way was, uh, would have influence on this route from San Francisco to Hawaii. Uh, so if we go back to that and the, the Lindbergh flight, May 21st, 22nd, uh, three days later, uh, James Dole announces that he too is going to offer a prize to fly from the mainland to or from the mainland to the Hawaiian Islands. And we'll talk about why he wanted to do that. Uh, that set in place uh, a timeline because it turned into a race, what Dole offered. He offered actually two prizes, one for the first uh, person to do that or crew to do that would be $25,000. The second prize would be $10,000. Well, right away now, when you do that, you're going to have to have some kind of a race whether you want it or not. You kind of fell into that. If you were a pilot considering something like that and to become the Pacific uh, Lindbergh, so to speak, $25,000 is a great motivator, but you wouldn't necessarily want to just go fly for $10,000 and uh, come in second and have no recognition other than the $10,000. That would be high risk. So in order to avoid that type of uh, possibility, they set a start date. The original start date for the Dole race would be August the 12th. That would move, but that was the original start date. However, even before that occurred, there were some other events that people were going to attempt to fly the Pacific route before the Dole race official start. One was going to be the United States Army. They announced three weeks after Dole announced his prize that they were going to uh, make an attempt to fly to Hawaii. Where we're going to be talking about each one of these flights prior to the Dole race itself. Uh, then there was this curious case of Richard Grace, not a well-known pilot, but at least in local circles he was well-known. He was going to be the first one to, as far as he was concerned, to complete that flight. 
Uh, the Army aviators took off on June 28th. If you see there, Richard Grace took off on June 27th. So we'll talk about the outcomes of each of those. And lo and behold, because Grace didn't make it, but the Army did, there was yet again going to be another attempt, and I'll get back to the uh, those that qualify, by Smith and Bronte. And again, this was all prior to the Dole race. In the meantime, if we look at this particular uh, a block on the timeline, 32 pilots applied to uh, qualify for the Dole race. That was, in order to qualify at that time, you had to fill out at least an application. And then the second phase would be submit your application a fee of $100. So all this activity took place before, as I said, the Dole uh, attempt that would be now uh, August 16th rather than August the 12th. So let's look at these. <clears throat> First of all, James Dole. Uh, he was a, a, a entrepreneur, a businessman. He, re, he got his degree from Harvard in international business. He had relatives on Hawaii. He got some land there and established a plantation at the turn of the century, a pineapple plantation. Did great marketing. Had a way of canning his pineapples to get them to market here in the United States and actually made quite a bit of uh, money doing that. The reason he established that Dole Prize, he wanted to bring attention to Hawaii. He also had the idea that it would be a while before people would actually uh, maybe compete for that prize simply because uh, 2,400 miles over water is a long way. Secondly, uh, the Ortiz Prize that Lindbergh just won, uh, that w went unclaimed for eight years before Lindbergh uh, made his flight. So that was, uh, he wasn't anticipating quite the response he got immediately after this flight. And we'll see why that happened in just a minute. He uh, was capitalizing obviously on the Lindbergh excitement. He was hoping Lindbergh himself would uh, participate in the race, but uh, that was just not going to happen. And he wanted to promote uh, the possibility, you know, Hawaii is really a nearby destination. All we have to do is have the right means of travel to shorten the time length to get there. So promote, at some point at least, uh, air service. <clears throat> now, back to the uh, race uh, itself, the Hawaii race now, as it's called, it's at the $35,000 purse. Uh, they, the papers were billing it more spectacular than the flight to Paris. The flight to Paris was a thousand miles longer. Uh, that was a spectacular flight. It was over a lot of water as well. Uh, the difference, I guess, between the two, there is no land uh, forms whatsoever between San Francisco and uh, the islands, and you have to be spot on uh, with your navigation uh, all the way across. But Lindbergh uh, had other activities he was going to be involved in, uh, such as his United States uh, tour of uh, uh, around the country before becoming involved with airlines and what have you. However, there was a lot of advertisement uh, uh, that went along with uh, Lindbergh that he was capitalizing on some of that as well. And he said, I had a wonderful engine. And that he did. He had the right uh, cyclone. And with that, others had the same engine now that were out there, and that would attract them to the possibility that maybe they too could uh, make a flight like Lindbergh. But now the prize was out there uh, on the uh, route from San Francisco to the Pacific, sponsored by Dole. And that's why you had a lot of applications going for that prize because that power plant would be available for most of the airplanes that were hoping to participate. Back to the Army though, they too had uh, the right Cyclone engines, but they also had a multi-engine aircraft. It was a Fokker 7-3 uh, engine plane that had been modified from the commercial version to the Fokker Army C-2. You see, it's called the Bird of Paradise. I'll mention that in a minute, how it got its name. It really modified in the sense the wing was different than the commercial version. Uh, there were fuel tanks that were being put into the aircraft that had large capacity. The one you see on your left, it would sit basically in the center area of the, uh, 
of the, the aircraft. That would be one tank. That was uh, 530 gallons. The one next to it was 335 gallons. They flew this aircraft after all of its modifications uh, from uh, McCook Wright Field out to San Francisco. When they arrived there, they decided they needed another 82 gallon tank. But up front, you can see the cockpit and back here would be the navigator station itself. Uh, the whole purpose of uh, this flight, they said it was not secret, it was purely to test navigational instruments uh, and the route to Hawaii would certainly uh, be able uh, to be a good testing ground for that. Uh, but again, the underlying factor was they've been planning this particular flight way before uh, the Dole race, even before Lindbergh's flight. They've been uh, planning this probably since uh, 1925 at the end of the Navy flight. Uh, they didn't say it was secret, but they did call it Project Z. When the newspapers uh, viewed the aircraft or saw the aircraft when it was out in San Francisco getting its uh, final uh, modifications for the flight itself, uh, the press named it the Bird of Paradise. Uh, they thought that would be appropriate since it's uh, hanging headed out there to the Hawaiian Islands uh, with the flower that of the same name. If we look down here at the aircraft itself as delivered versus as modified, again, you can see the uh, magnitude of the change due to the fuel of the gross weight of the airplane. And uh, that would be a very heavy aircraft itself. Now the crew that organized and was behind this flight from the Army or the uh, 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 two fellows I'm going to introduce you to after we talk about this gentleman right here. Because the Bird of Paradise was going to be uh, ready to go on June 28th. This fella, his name is uh, Dick Grace. And Dick Grace was a World War I pilot, a, a real character, I suppose. He was trained by the Navy, so he was a naval officer during World War I. Uh, he did get overseas. After the war, he came back and he found himself kind of a, a, a niche, uh, a way to make a, a good living, and that was with Hollywood. And his specialty was uh, crashing aircraft in front of the cameras uh, for various um, movie uh, genre that was coming out, uh, having an aviation theme, as you see here in, in Wide Open. That was one of his. Um, this is an interesting photograph simply because how many pilots do you see after crashing the aircraft uh, proudly stand by it? Well, he crashed in his career probably in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 aircraft, survived it all. He made a real science out of crashing airplanes. He got hurt a few times, sometimes uh, seriously, put him in the hospital a time or two. But nonetheless, uh, he was making a good living doing that. At the same time, out there with the Hollywood crowd, he was around the aviation industry, San Diego, Los Angeles, what have you, and he would come in contact with a number of folks that uh, were involved with uh, airplane construction and building. Uh, Martin was out there, Ryan. Bill Waterhouse was a designer uh, that worked for Ryan Aircraft Company and had a lot to do with the, uh, some of the analysis of the Spirit of St. Louis. He had built this aircraft, that is Waterhouse, for another Navy uh, commander, Kroger, and somehow uh, Grace uh, acquired the aircraft or it was sponsored by Kroger, and he modified it for a flight uh, to go across the Pacific. His plan was a little different though. After the modification, which this aircraft was called the Cruise Air, it looks like Orion that Lindbergh flew to some degree, uh, he put it on board a ship and he got on the ship and they both uh, went out to Oahu, arrived in Oahu in the middle of June of 1927. And uh, when the, uh, the aircraft was brought off the ship and they started to assemble the airplane at Wheeler Field, discovered that uh, sabotage had occurred somewhere along the line. Somebody took a saw and saw three quarters of the way through one of the propeller blades. So he had a problem. However, the Army, even though he was an ex-Navy guy, the Army is kind enough to provide him a propeller. He still had a problem, but this guy doesn't quit. The problem was there was no place on Oahu 
for a fuel load that he was going to carry for him to get off the ground. The runways weren't long enough. The only possible place that he, that he scouted out was on Kauai. There is the Barking Sands sh uh, shoreline or beach, which is uh, uh, from former volcanic ash. It was hard enough, long enough, smooth enough for him to uh, make a takeoff run. So they had to disassemble the airplane, take it over there, reassemble it. But yet another problem occurred. Barking sands with that volcanic ash, the temperature of the beach during the day is uh, hot enough that on his takeoff run, he blew out his tires due to the heat. And he did that twice. He only had another set of tires left and had to take off uh, early in the morning. He finally learned the lesson. But his problems weren't over with yet. He takes off and that aircraft he had, had a fuel tank in it, probably with enough fuel. And his idea is if I can just take off and start heading kind of in a uh, northeast north uh, direction, sometime after 25 hours or so, I should be able to hit the continental uh, United States or somewhere north or south of it. You know, I will need a navigator. But what he did need was stability. And that fuel tank, uh, once it got a little bump in the air when they, he flew through a rain shower, it started to have a lot of oscillation, uh, a lot of uh, gyration of the, long, the longitudinal axis around the lateral axis, and he could not control the aircraft uh, only in short uh, distances. He turned around, made it back to a Kauai, and yet did another uh, uh, Richard Grace type of landing, crashed the airplane. This time, it knocked him unconscious temporarily. On board the aircraft with him, believe it or not, was his dog. <laughs> and his dog was the one who uh, brought him to by licking his uh, a noggin. Uh, you can see all the people that arrived after the accident. Here would have been the hard shoreline that he had taken off from somewhere along that area. So Richard Grace, uh, put all his money, all his time, all his effort in that flight, and now essentially he had nothing. But still, he went back to Hollywood and continued to do what he did very well. He wrote books about it, such as A Squadron of Death, had a great sense of humor. Uh, one time he crashed an airplane, went to the hospital, he had to come back out and uh, participate in another scene, as, but he put a neck brace around himself and told everybody he was going to fly with a broken neck. It wasn't, but that's what he told them. Uh, again, you would think somebody like this would um, die in the airplane itself, itself at some point, but he continued to push his luck. Somehow he talked himself into the Army Air Corps in 1941 as an instructor pilot, specializing in teaching bomber crews <laughs> how to crash uh, large airplanes. And he went from there to talking himself in the combat and he actually had about 32 combat missions in the Mediterranean theater of operation. Uh, he, did, he, uh, he died in bed uh, and his flying helmet uh, was not on. So he had a, a good, interesting life. But back to the folks that made the first flight to the islands. Again, it was a well-planned out uh, flight, well thought out. The navigator uh, was Lieutenant uh, Hedgenberger, uh, Annapolis graduate. He was also a pilot. The, the pilot was uh, Mitlin. Uh, Mitlin was an exceptional pilot as well. Uh, he was a West Point graduate. If I said uh, Hedgenberger was West Point as well, if I said Annapolis, I was incorrect. Anyway, these two guys uh, uh, were going to make the flight. Uh, Hedgenberger was the one that was developing different types of compasses and radio equipment. And that's why the, he wanted to experiment out over the water. He had been to navigation school uh, with the Navy. Uh, uh, Midland understood uh, celestial navigation would be doing most of the flying itself. In the airplane, uh, when they left, on June 28th, uh, it was a pretty straightforward flight. Here you can see the log and the position reports that uh, uh, Hedgenberger was keeping along with uh, the gallons and the fuel burn. Uh, about 3.30 in the morning, uh, they uh, spotted the lighthouse of Kauai. It was only five degrees off their nose. They didn't go right into uh, Oahu to, a while, uh, to a Wheeler Field. The reason? Uh, weather was there, so they held 
uh, with uh, at the, uh, the lighthouse until that fog uh, cleared. And even with that, when they arrived, there was a 25 hour and 50 minute flight. Here you can see their arrival overhead and of course the traditional lie that they got uh, upon arrival. One of the interesting things is they were both very hungry and they both uh, uh, wanted to get something to drink. They had about uh, seven or eight sandwiches on board. Uh, they just couldn't find them. Uh, apparently, uh, they were put under some equipment back by the navigation compartment, and one of the ground crew found them all when th they had landed. Uh, the upshot of all this is they won the Mackey Trophy for that flight in 1927. That was for the uh, a trophy that uh, the military gets for one of the services would get for the most uh, uh, meritorious flight of that year. So again, it was kind of an Army-Navy thing, but the reality of it is the Army-Navy uh, cooperated uh, back and forth um, in most of these events. Uh, the Navy, as an example, kept on their uh, ships and their navigation uh, or their radio equipment, etc., for the Army to use. But they became the first ones to complete that flight. So what's the purpose now of the do of the uh, the uh, the, do uh, the uh, uh, dole race? Well, uh, the purpose was there's people who'd like to be out there and be known as the first civilians. Ernest Smith was one of those. Here you can see him standing here with his navigator Bronte, who, by the way, is not his first navigator. His first navigator. Uh, Smith took off before the Bird of Paradise took off, but they had some issues when the navigator's uh, windshield above the uh, aircraft where he, do, where he would do a celestial uh, navigation, it blew off and hit the tail. They had to come back. Uh, they had some engine uh, issues. Uh, the upshot was the navigator had enough of this. He felt the aircraft was not properly equipped. So now Smith, who wasn't really in it for the money. He was in it for the uh, uh, recognition of being the first civilian to cross, even though the Army has done that already. Uh, he had to go look for another navigator. He put an ad in the paper, and this young man, Emory uh, Bronte, showed up. He was uh, a qualified Marine navigator. He, would, he wanted to participate. Uh, he didn't care about the money either. He wanted the adventure, uh, but he insisted that the airplane, which was a Travel Air 5000, which you see over here, have some modifications to it. Number one, put in the proper uh, navigation gear, not just a celestial navigate, uh, a celestial sextant uh, and a uh, and a compass, but he wanted some proper compasses, uh, Earth indicator compasses, and uh, drift meter, etc. Smith agreed to that. So they didn't get off the ground until July 14th is when they were going to head out. And if we look at their airplane in terms of the fuel it was going to carry, it was going to carry 425 gallons uh, above the standard 75 gallons that the aircraft is normally used to carry. Their flight, however, when they took off, even though it was 5,100 pounds above the gross weight, when they left the San Francisco, Oakland area, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, Bronte was a very exceptional navigator. They could use some of their uh, radio equipment a couple of times. One of those times was to report to the uh, uh, radio station at Wheeler Field. They estimated that they were two hours out of uh, Hawaii and on, on their way in, at which point there was radio silence and they weren't heard of for a long time. Where were they? Uh, where they were, uh, they were coming into the islands and uh, they were realizing that they were low on fuel. Uh, as a matter of fact, Smith told uh, Bronte to get the life raft out when they saw one of the islands, Molokai, which is uh, uh, one of the southern islands, came into view. He figured he could make that. Uh, 
but the problem was where he wanted to land, he didn't want to land in the water for fear of losing the airplane or the airplane turning upside down on him. And the shoreline where the water was and the actual beach itself, here you can see some of the ripples. It was pretty narrow due to the fact this was a cliff, there was a road and then another cliff. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what Bronte, excuse me, what Smith Trial wanted to do, he wanted to uh, land in the trees. And you can see his path that was through these trees that he selected to land among and came to a stop at this point here. If the dark area will explode that, you would find an airplane where they land. Uh, they both walked out of the accident in good shape. Uh, they didn't know exactly where they were. Uh, they quickly found out because a couple of farm folks came from a field and took them to the nearest telephone, which happened to be a leper colony, uh, where they called Wheeler and said, uh, you, we're okay, this is where we are. Wheeler was going to send a couple of observation planes to pick them up, uh, which they did. Uh, there is a marker where they land that's still there to this day, at least it was back in 2002 when I saw it. But uh, if they commemorate the spot, now those are the first civilians to land in a, a semi-successful, at least it was more successful than the, uh, the uh, uh, Navy in terms of uh, having to uh, float into Hawaii, but there they were. <clears throat> Uh, but the last part of the trip, after some celebratory uh, hands in the air, I'm glad to be alive for a number of reasons, greatly relieved. They still had to face 60 miles to Wheeler Field and an observation plane. They got, they got to meet the uh, governor of Hawaii, who is wondering what is bringing all these aviators <laughs> to the islands all of a sudden, that I have to go and meet everybody and get in my uh, uh, tuxedo. Uh, Bronte and Smith were, went back to San Francisco. They had, I believe, a parade in San Francisco, but that was about the end of the celebration for them. Although Bronte uh, did assist a lot of the Dole crews that were getting ready now to cross and compete for the Dole prize itself. So that kind of now brings us to the Dole race and the media frenzy that took place probably from the beginning of August until the actual conclusion of the race. So we'll, we'll cover that. <clears throat> As I said, there were 32 <clears throat> folks that applied for it, uh, filling out the application. <clears throat> of that 32, there was going to be 18 that actually paid their fee. <clears throat> uh, of the 18, Eight were going to make it to the starting line. Of the eight that made it to the starting line on the uh, 16th of August, four of them would actually go out of, over the water and on their way to Hawaii, and two would arrive. So we'll kind of take a look at this uh, cadre of aircraft flyers and what they had to do in order to get to the starting line and compete for the Dole Prize. That is the first place prize of $25,000 and the second place prize of 10,000. Dole, to his credit, really wanted this to be run well. He didn't want it to be a sideshow. He wanted to uh, have in place uh, at least all the possible things you can do to make the race as safe as possible. Uh, they had the drawing on the initial start date of the race, August 12th, but that would be at the Madison building in San Francisco. He had a race committee. He did, was not part of that committee. He let the committee decide everything. The starting positions were going to be based on those that were eligible uh, to be drawn, the 18 people who paid their fee. Three did not show up, so you were down to 15 already. There were some requirements for both the pilot as well as the navigator. You had to be a licensed transport pilot, which we call an ATP today. Your flying ability was going to be checked by the CAA, just like you would be checked by the FAA. The pilots had to demonstrate 
to fly a cross country course set by their navigator. Now this is something new because most pilots haven't had that kind of uh, uh, luxury to have a navigator on board types of flying they were doing. They had to make a takeoff, 50% load of their total fuel load, uh, which the airplane, even at that, would be over gross weight. And the uh, Hawaiian Islands, 317 miles wide, you had to be kind of spot on with your navigation, three degrees either side of that, and there was a very good likelihood that you would miss the islands entirely. So they went through and uh, drew their starting positions. <clears throat> Uh, and they were going to, of course, have to pass their test. Uh, they were going to have to have that certified navigator on board, that practical navigation test. And one of the things, uh, it's not shown in here, but their aircraft had to have a cruising speed of at least 90 miles an hour and a 10% fuel reserve above, above the required flight based on that 90 miles an hour and what they will say was their, their fuel flow. So it was uh, requirements that uh, were not slipshod. Uh, the airplane had to be at least a certified airplane uh, when it came out of the factory or at least experimental level. And it had to meet these requirements that you see here. Uh, here's an example of some of the aircraft that were uh, eligible for the drawing. We'll talk about some of these airplanes. Uh, but it was after the fact that the media was starting to uh, be uh, critical, when I say after the fact, after the race was over, of the quality of the pilots uh, themselves. They said these pilots, uh, some of them actually said, uh, were a motley crew. They were not. They were well qualified for that time. They did have experience. Uh, yes, they were in high risk positions like uh, Dick Grace crashing airplanes. Uh, Art Goebel was one of those pilots uh, who had a organization called Black Cat 13, which supplied the movie, again, with stunt pilots, as well as a, a variety of uh, air show uh, acts where you transfer uh, from one plane to the other uh, by going out on the wing and dropping into the cockpit of another, parachute jumping, et cetera. But that's how they made their living. That's what was available at the time. Um, all the pilots, I would say, had a great deal of experience. Uh, the, you can have a great deal of experience, though. What was new, of course, is they were going to do something they had never done before, fly over water for an extended period of time, holding a heading with a navigator on board. That was the, the, the main, major difference, and the takeoff itself, which we'll talk about. The other thing that was uh, happening is uh, the airplanes were, were checked out thoroughly. Uh, they had their own mechanics. They had representatives of uh, the Wright uh, engine company. Uh, they had uh, propeller men. They had radio technicians uh, for the two aircraft that had radios. And as you can see here, they had a lot of quasi officials that just hung around because they could and got the pit pass as well as a media trying to look for the uh, human interest stories, which they found plenty. So in that sense, you might can say it was a, a circus, but the pilots themselves, uh, the night before the race started, uh, shut all that down. <clears throat> so they were, they were very serious about it. Even prior to the race though, this is some of the tragedies that uh, occurred that had nothing to do with the dull race in itself. A couple of the participants were naval officers, as you see here, this uh, Lieutenant uh, Koval and uh, the navigator Wagner. They were going to fly an aircraft called the Hummingbird. They named it uh, the spirit of John Rogers, after John Rogers, the uh, commander of uh, PN9. Uh, John Rogers had died in an aircraft accident uh, within a year of his flight to Hawaii when he was flying up from uh, the Washington area to the Philadelphia Aircraft Factory, his airplane uh, crash landed in the Schuylkill, or the, excuse me, the Delaware River, and he, he drowned. So that was the, the spirit of John Rogers. They took off uh, four days prior to the start of the Dole Race, which would be around August the 12th, 
Uh, they would have another crew member on board by the name of Davis. He was going to be the navigator on another Dole racer, um, the Willow Rock, which we'll talk about. He could not get his uh, leave in time, so he had to take the train the next day, fortunately for him, because when this aircraft took off, it took off in some low visibility uh, uh, ground fog out of San Diego and crashed into the side of Point Loma. The airplane exploded, caught on fire, and unfortunately, the two lost their lives. Another aircraft was lost uh, on its uh, flight into Oakland to participate on, uh, for the Dole race. This one was called the Pride of Los Angeles, the uh, uh, Carton uh, Fisk International. Actually, it was a good airplane, even though it was a, a triplane that looked somewhat uh, antiquated, uh, but it was modified. It had uh, fuel tanks put in that were properly built and the baffle. It was going to carry a, a, a pilot, navigator, both well qualified. Uh, they came up to Oakland to go through their qualifying test uh, on landing. They touched down, the aircraft swerved to the side, they attempted a go around, and they wound up uh, off the field in the bay, as you see here. One of the backers of this aircraft was a Hollywood star, uh, Tom Mix. He was pretty upset by uh, the fact that his investment uh, was wound up where it did. Nonetheless, another aircraft out of the race. Still yet, uh, a pilot by the name of uh, Arthur Rogers, uh, flying a, a Brian, as they called it, monoplane. Uh, was going to do a flight test on August the 12th prior to flying this airplane that you see with the uh, twin tail at Western uh, Airlines Field. Here you can see the Douglas Mail planes. Uh, uh, taking on a, a, a test, uh, his navigator was there. The navigator stayed on the ground as well as his wife. The, he flew over the field one time, kind of came back around for a landing, and about 125 feet in the air or so, structural failure occurred, losing a wing. The aircraft fell to the ground, and he too lost his life in that effort. So now you have uh, three individuals and uh, three airplanes that were going to participate in that race, and now they're out. So here we have the Oakland Air Airport where the flight was going to be launched from. Uh, Oakland Airport, Airport at that time was just a field, Bay, uh, Bay Farm Field, I believe it was referred to. Uh, it was uh, even and plowed, it had good drainage, but it was 7,000 feet long, and that gave uh, enough room for all the aircraft with the fuel loads they were going to carry, room to get off. But here is also where all the flight testing would be taking place to qualify the navigators as well as the pilots. And it was a pretty straightforward uh, test where they would take off uh, a course designated by the examiner, uh, fly to a point, it would be a triangle leg. This would be a uh, Mar Island, 350 degrees, 27 miles away. You go ahead and make your left turn, head 235 to the uh, Farlon Islands, uh, which is 49 miles away and back to Oakland, uh, pretty much straight east, 43 miles away. The reality of it was, that's nothing more than a maybe a private pilot's uh, qualification or part of a qualification in uh, his uh, uh, their training. So uh, the the thing of it was is that three people, uh, three crews, actually failed uh, that type of a test. Now this wasn't the only round. I'm just showing you an example of one. And of course, what everybody was concerned about your navigators being playing a key role. Well, the navigators pretty much knew how to uh, navigate. They were all uh, Marine, uh, either commercial Marine or through the Navy, but uh, the pilots holding the course. Uh, so they, three of them were disqualified on a test similar to this. Aircraft were flying in. Uh, the two pilots, uh, well, the pilot and the navigator were well qualified. They came in from the city of Peoria and they were very concerned about their airplane in the fact that the aircraft could not maintain 90 miles an hour and the fuel flow was uh, high enough that even at below 90, they were gonna be running out of fuel. 
Uh, they tried to bring this up, well, they did bring this up to the uh, inspectors at the field that were, again, uh, having some quality control over the uh, aircraft that were uh, proposing to be entering into the contest. And this is a very interesting letter that is sent to uh, this Major uh, Young, who was the Director of Aeronautics and was also on the Dole uh, Committee. Uh, from one of his inspectors, uh, Parkins. Parkins uh, discussed some issues with the uh, Air King crew, and basically they said, he said, that they told him, uh, both the pilot and the navigator, that they lay awake at night, uh, trying to figure out how they can uh, possibly have enough fuel to get to the uh, Hawaiian Islands. Uh, Parkins suggested that uh, they uh, uh, let the sponsors know. Well, they were reluctant to do that because it says right up in here, they didn't want to appear to be yellow. Well, um, finally, uh, they just couldn't figure it out. They, they did tell the sponsors, but before they did, they also told the media. It, at which point, Parkins is writing a letter to uh, Young. And it's not so much about that. He's bringing up the issue that the inspectors on the field really have, they can check the power plant, they can check all the other requirements, they can check the fuel flow, but they don't have any idea what the crews of these airplanes are going to be. They have to really rely on the pilots to tell them what their actual cruise speed is, whether it's 90 miles an hour or not. They just had no way of checking that. So that might come into play later on when we look at some of the results of the Dole race itself. <clears throat> now. They removed the Air King about uh, on race day, and it would not participate and be part of the starting group. Weather, of course, uh, over the Pacific is generally better than that over the Atlantic. You have the Pacific high in the, in the uh, summertime, but where that's located and how strong it is or not is always a question. The newspapers painted kind of the uh, ideal bridge over the uh, Pacific with uh, the fact that if you stay within the confines of that uh, wind, that envelope on the north and south of the island with all the ships that are out there along the route that will be lending support, be it commercial, be it Navy, uh, you have this fine bridge to cross through moonlight and sunlight. Well, it didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, but again, this was the ideal picture. The aircraft that actually made it to the starting line was a mix of uh, uh, a variety of airplanes, two Travel Air 5000s. Now, Ernest Smith had a Travel Air 5000, so that made three Travel Airs in, in the mix. Uh, two Breeze, uh, one the Aloha, the other the uh, Bafco Flyer, again, sponsored by a variety of uh, uh, entrepreneurs. You had the Goddard Special, that was a high wing uh, modern airplane. It was uh, uh, made of me uh, aluminum, metal. And this is an interesting airplane, uh, the uh, Golden Eagle, uh, Lockheed Vega. That's uh, number one of the uh, high wing Jack Northrop influenced design that Lockheed had. A Swallow uh, from the Swallow Aircraft Company, Matty Lair, and the Miss Doran. That was the uh, uh, bi only bi wing that made it to the starting line. So that was your starting lineup before the August 16th day. If we look at the basic characteristics of this aircraft, they all had the right cyclone, every one of them. Seven out of eight were all high wing. Uh, seven out of eight were basic wooden fabric construction, which is not too usual or unusual for 1927. All uh, required to have that 90 mile an hour cruise speed uh, based on what the, the crews were telling the uh, those that were uh, inspecting the airplanes. Only two had a basic radio capability. Uh, the, the engineering that went into that for the certification of the standard airplane as delivered was quite good, but uh, the modifications that were being made, uh, there would be, uh, of course, there's questions to that. Flight testing uh, was, I would not say, never done properly because the only time they ever talk, took off with a full fuel load was going to be on race day. And even though you might have taken off with 50% fuel load, if you increase that by another 50%, uh, that changes airplane characteristics altogether. 
and none had taken off with full fuel load, and none had ever gone on a flight that long with a navigator. And, and some of the time, the, these navigators and pilots only knew each other for a few days. But nonetheless, uh, that was the best at the time, at the time of the start of the race. And here we can see the starting line and the aircraft that are uh, being lined up according to the draw that they had for uh, their starting position. And there would be a, taking off at intervals of, of about, uh, I don't know exactly what it was now, I think I remember it to be about, uh, uh, about 10 to 15 to 20 minutes apart, something of that nature. Anyway, in looking at this uh, starting field, 7,000 feet of runway, it says that there was an estimate of 75 to 100,000 people. It usually varies on what you uh, look at. I, I'm looking at this right now. It doesn't look like there's a lot of people, but 7,000 feet and people lined up all the way around that perimeter, uh, they can be spread out um, fairly well. Anyway, the starting lineup looked like this, uh, one through eight. We'll talk about each of these airplanes uh, and basically what happened. Um, to start with, the Oklahoma, uh, it took off, had engine problems and came around, landed and returned. Uh, they withdrew from the race. So the number one start, uh, that was their story. The uh, El Canto, uh, the Goddard monoplane, it crashed on takeoff. It was out of the race. The Bafco Flyer, it too crashed on its second attempt. It was out of the race. And I would suspect uh, the heavy fuel loads had something to do with that. Uh, the number eight aircraft, when it took off, it, uh, it returned with um, a fuselage damage and it would take off three days later. Uh, obviously out of the race, but they were going to compete for another prize that included, uh, allowed for one stop and then fly on into the uh, uh, Pacific area. So uh, four aircraft were out of the race uh, at, at the start line. <clears throat> now for the other four that remained, uh, we'll take a look at these two. Uh, the Golden Eagle, that was the Lockheed Vega uh, designed by uh, of influence and designed by uh, Northrop, working for Lockheed. Uh, it took off, uh, they were lost at sea, they were never found, as well as the Miss Doran. And the Miss Doran had three people on board, Augie Pedler, the pilot, who won the draw to be the pilot, a flip of a coin, uh, and Cope, uh, who was his navigator. And they also had on board uh, a young lady by the name of Mildred Doran uh, from Wisconsin, who had met the crew and wanted to be part of it. Uh, they called her the good luck charm. Uh, she was very pleasant, a, a media darling, as they would say today, or at that, at that time frame. Uh, they took off, uh, they were lost at sea and never found. Which brings us to the two aircraft, other than the Dallas Spirit, which we already mentioned, they would take off three days later and be lost at sea. But the two aircraft that remained that um, actually made the flight was the Aloha and the, the Willow Rock. So we'll talk briefly about those two. Walter Beach uh, was at Travel Air at the time and Art Goebel, who was also a stunt pilot in Hollywood, raised enough money to give a healthy down payment for the uh, Willow Rock excuse me, well, the, the travel air at the time, and didn't have enough money uh, to actually make the purchase. And Walter Beach connected him with Frank Phillips, an oilman and a, who would become the financial sponsor. Frank Phillips agreed that uh, they would be the sponsor of the aircraft uh, and would pay a lot of the uh, uh, fuel expenses, but he would like the name of the aircraft to be the Willow Rock which was named after his estate in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which consisted of woodlands, a lake, and lots of rock. Uh, so that was a, an easy agreement. Here you see uh, Goebel with his uh, navigator, a Navy uh, navigator, Davis. He was the one that missed the flight on the Hummingbird due to the fact that his uh, leave hadn't come through to participate on that flight. So he would be part of the crew uh, that would guide Goebel across the water. 
their flight of all the flights we've talked about was probably the most straightforward. Uh, they had a radio transmitter. They pretty much stayed on course. Uh, they didn't have a lot of issues with um, fuel starvation, anything of that nature. They came within sight of uh, Wheeler Field. The only issue they had, there was again a lot of ground fog. They let it burn off. They found it uh, relatively easy, uh, made the landing. And when they came in to land, there was a large crowd to greet them. Here you can see a number of Army planes that uh, Goble thought were some of the winners who took off before him because bear in mind, uh, even though some crashed on takeoff, others did take off before him. So they thought perhaps he, they were uh, the fifth one to arrive. Those are actually Army aircraft. Again, he came out, uh, hands in the air, traditional lie. And uh, I think hands in the air when you land in Hawaii is, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't think that's still going on, but it, it went on <laughs> during the, that time. Uh, you can see that they finished in 26 hours and 19 minutes and got $25,000. One of the first persons that uh, Goble ran into was a woman came out of the group and asked if uh, he had seen any uh, of the other flyers, specifically Martin Jensen in the Aloha, because Martin Jensen was her husband and all our Goble could tell her is, I haven't seen anybody until I got here. Well, uh, th there you have uh, a relieved look on Goble, and rightfully so. <clears throat> Meantime, the flight of uh, Martin Jensen and his navigator, uh, uh, Schuttler, uh, was a completely different flight. When they took off out of Oakland, uh, they uh, st stayed low simply because they did not want to fly over a um, overcast that they were encountering. And the overcast kept coming down. Jensen decided, well, I'm going to take a chance here. Now, bear in mind, these pilots, again, there was no such thing as uh, instrument ratings. Uh, they, he attempted to fly up into the clouds three, I think, three times and fell out each time and a spiral, and one time he put it into an intentional spin to get out. So based on that experience, they decided to stay low. And Jensen stayed low to the water, uh, thinking that he would be uh, preserving uh, fuel. A couple of times, uh, or he hit the water, the wheels skimmed the water, and spray came up and hit the aircraft and what have you. He decided he better go higher than just uh, down to the water level itself. So they, they were flying precariously. Uh, during the morning hours, uh, he started to develop a fuel pump problem. And now he got the uh, navigator to work a wobble pump, which he had to work continuously, uh, neglecting navigational duties, which at the time there weren't much other than hold your compass heading because he couldn't get a fix due to the overcast. And as the morning wore on, they climbed uh, finally uh, high enough and got above some of the breaking up clouds now where they wanted to wait until they got to uh, the noonday sun. So they started to circle because both their marine compass and their navig navigation compass or aviation compass uh, in the airplane itself uh, were malfunctioning or reading uh, completely differently from each other. So the navigator wanted to take a sun fix, and that's why they had a circle for three hours to wait for that, hoping their fuel was going to uh, uh, remain. When he was able to take that fix, the navigator, Schuler uh, estimated they were 200 miles from Oahu, and, that, and they had uh, made a uh, beeline for that. They came upon the air, uh, airport, and they realized, of course, that they were not the first to arrive. They did, did see uh, the Willow Rock, the traveler down there. And if you'll notice the crowd, they had left because they were waiting around and there was no other aircraft showing up, but they heard on the radio that they, they were sighted and coming in the crowd started to return. In that tent down there, uh, right across from the uh, Willow Rock itself, where you see it sitting there, there was a tent, a VIP tent. And in that tent, was Mrs. Jensen and James Dole. 
Uh, she's quite happy now because she has heard, at least uh, through some communication, that uh, the Aloha has been spotted. Mrs. Jensen herself uh, stayed on Hawaii and helped raise funds for Martin Jensen's airplane. And again, one of these uh, opportunities that they put everything they had into this, this endeavor. And uh, finally, the Aloha landed uh, in 28 hours, about two hours behind. Goble had five gallons of fuel remaining. Everybody qu looks quite relieved. Uh, there was a story in the paper that Martin Jensen, of course, happy with the $10,000 prize, but because of all the bills, etc., provided um, he gave he gave his navigator $25 for the effort. <laughs> and uh, his rationale was because the navigator was approaching all all the uh, entrants that were did not have uh, navigators that he would fly with them for free, <laughs> but. Uh, that's what he's. That's that. That is the uh, the legend. Uh, how the legend goes. <clears throat> of course, uh, they were happy to be there. Um, however, uh, there was a downside to all of this, and the, obviously, there was a number of aircraft that didn't get off the ground. And even more tragically, right, right then, there were several that they knew were in the water, and their survival was uh, chances of were minimum at best, including uh, Miss Thorin. So the attention turned not so much to those that had accomplished the flight, but those who did not, and rightfully so, because if you get the pre-race losses, which we've talked about, of Rogers and the Navy pilot, as well as his navigator, Wagner, uh, combine that <clears throat> with uh, the loss of uh, the crew of the Miss Thorin and later on uh, uh, Scott and uh, Frost uh, on the uh, Dallas airplane. Uh, that was a huge sacrifice and a price to pay that nobody really wanted to or was happy about it. And not to mention uh, uh, this was the crew of the Dallas, the others were the Vega crew. So all in all, there was a, quite a, a uh, price to pay for, for this endeavor. A memorial was held, rightfully so, on September 16th off the coast of the, the islands uh, where they were commemorated. Uh, there was some uh, uh, joy, of course, at the fact that at least two participants actually made the flight, but it made everybody realize what a hazardous undertaking and what, you know, the islands weren't quite ready for uh, airline activity on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 1934 that Pan Am announced that they were going to start commercial service first with some surveying and building up of flight bases uh, along the way. And it became uh, uh, two flights a week around 1938, 39 into 1940. Uh, the Willarock, rightfully so, uh, or uh, the Petroleum Company of Phillips uh, congratulated the Willarock, Davis and his navigator. This airplane uh, today is on display at the Willow Rock Museum, which was part of uh, the estate of uh, uh, Frank Phillips. Uh, when I uh, went to work for Cessna back in 1971, uh, uh, I went down there to visit and see the airplane. Uh, that uh, it was quite a sight and it was nice to see an actual airplane that participated in that race. I had a, a kind of a, an interest in the race, which I'm gonna explain here uh, in a moment, that got me in touch with one of the winners. It wasn't our goal, so that only leaves uh, uh, Jensen. Uh, but before we do that, if we look at all that activity and all that uh, flying that happened in the summer of 1927, you can see that's why uh, there was quite a bit of excitement between the West Coast and the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, you can make anything you want of the statistics that you see listed here. Uh, the 13 attempts and the 30 people that were involved, uh, they all made a contribution. They all had the right motivation to do what they were doing, whether it be for fame and perceived fortune they might read, receive or the fact that there was a love of an adventure and a challenge. Uh, that's why it happened. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands today, of course, well, not today, but uh, prior to the current situation we're in, at least uh, up until uh, 2000, 
19, you had over uh, 10.2 million visitors come to the island by air each year uh, from all over the world, not just the West Coast. So uh, you know, they were way ahead of their time, that was all. This is a great shot and one I particularly like because it shows uh, some of the participants of all the different types of Hawaiian flights that we had just talked about. Uh, Barry Ladder will be talking about the flight of the Southern Cross and the crew. Here's one of them that were celebrating a reunion in 1962. Uh, Hedgenberger, he was a general, he stayed in the service. Uh, he was the uh, navigator for the Bird of Paradise. Art Goebel uh, was the winner. Uh, this gentleman right here, his name is uh, Martin Jensen. Uh, I uh, came in contact with him. I've never met, met him personally, but uh, the story is that uh, when I got out of the military, I went back to college, or I should say, I went to college. And part of the, the curriculum was getting through English 101 and 102, which still was the two most challenging courses I ever had in college. You know, bring on the math and the chemistry, that makes sense. But anyway, I had to write a term paper. And uh, I came across a uh, professor who had a soft spot in his heart for aviation. And I read an article somewhere about the Dole race. And I thought, well, I'll do a term paper on that. And uh, he said, sure, that would be fine. In that article, uh, Martin Jensen was mentioned that he lived in California and still was alive and somewhere in the Los Angeles area. In those days, you could call up the operator and ask for information. And they not only gave you the telephone number, they gave you the address where people live. Uh, I called him. And uh, well, first, before I called him, I should, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I sent him a letter. And in the letter, I told him what I was doing and if he had any information about the Dole race that I might be able to glean or talk to him and uh, because I, I like to do the hands-on stuff. Well, he sent me this letter back. It was a short letter. And you can see it's addressed to me where I was living at the time in Arizona. And he simply said, I'd love to help you. I don't have much. Uh, the only thing I have are all the clippings that the uh, Dole people sent to me after the race. And I have those, and they have never been put anywhere other than in a file, I'll send them to you. And he did. And they came in this envelope that you're looking at. And from that, I was able to kind of uh, cobble together a story of the Dole race, which became this term paper, as you see, written in uh, March of 1968. By the way, I got an A on the term paper, and that's the last day I ever got in any kind of English class at all. But uh, uh, I sent him a copy of the paper and back, of course, to his uh, clippings. And in the in-between times, I did have three telephone conversations uh, with him. And he did tell me about hitting the water, uh, falling out of the overcast. Uh, he was a very pleasant guy to talk with. So that was kind of the start of uh, my interest in uh, actually, uh, aviation history is, is just kind of a general topic, became a lifelong interest. Uh, in terms of uh, further information of what uh, you might like to pursue, I re reference here a few books uh, in the reference section. They're all very good. They all have great information. I borrowed uh, the title for this talk from two of them, the, the 1927 Summer and Above the Pacific. I cobbled that together for a talk of this presentation. But I'd like to call your attention to this book right here, uh, the most recent book by Jason Ryan. It is excellent and it goes into great detail and it covers the flights that we talked about. Uh, so if you have any further interest, I would encourage you to try to find yourself a copy of this at uh, your favorite bookstore, uh, library. Uh, ironically, the way I got in touch with Jason Ryan uh, one day I got an email and it was from Jason Ryan and he was researching, he had researched the book. The book was already in draft form. And he, in that research, he visited the Willow Rock Museum and lo and behold, he came across my term paper, which I gave them after I visited the museum. So that's the other end of the book end. So, uh, <laughs> so we have Martin Jensen 
and the last book written about the Dole race itself. So if you have any questions about this, by now you know the drill, you can uh, uh, inquire and write us and we'll get back to you with the answers. It's always a pleasure to talk to this group. I'm looking forward as always to doing this in person. It's always a lot easier to do it in person. But in the meantime, uh, I, I enjoy the fact that uh, Historic Flight Foundation and the crew that's behind this, and including our producer, Liz, uh, uh, bringing this to you. So have a good day, folks, and we'll see you soon. Stay safe. <laughs>